Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. So, Rashni Shangani, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me in the middle of your busy schedule. Yeah, not a problem, man. It's really a pleasure. You know, uh, actually, we've been chatting backwards and forwards a couple of times and talking about getting you on here. And I actually only found out recently that you're actually an endocrinologist. And I think if I'd found that out earlier, or I would have had you on earlier because I always get so excited when I hear about an endocrinologist that actually gets it because um, they just seem to be the, the group of doctors uh, within this community that, that are more resistant to, to accepting this way of life as a, as, a, as a therapeutic intervention, as a, as a valid intervention. And I, I'm always interested, and maybe we can even delve into that a little bit and give, you can give your ideas yeah. about it. But maybe just to get started, um, tell us your story. Um, I mean, you're based there in Mumbai, and it would be really cool to, and interesting to hear about what you're doing there. But maybe let's just start out with, uh, with your backstory and, and how, you, uh, how you got into this and how you found out about it. Sure, thank you. Um, I'd love to share uh, what's been going on. Um, So you're right, I'm in Mumbai. I've kind of spent uh, a a large portion of my life in both the United States and in India. So I've gotten the chance to have the best of both worlds. Um, My zero to 10 growing up was in Chicago. And then I came to Mumbai for the first time when I was and I started my schooling and I was here in the city until finishing medical college, so medical school, MBBS in Mumbai. And then I went back to the United States for my internal medicine and my endocrinology. And then I was in private practice in Chicago. Uh, So that was another 10 year sprint in the US, uh, including some private practice. And then we came back as family to be closer to family so that our kids could know their grandparents more than just a once a week voice call. Cause when we moved in 2011, it really wasn't easy to do a video call. Um, so we moved back and it's been about tw- almost 12 years now that I've been practicing in Mumbai. And I wouldn't say that I was a low carb person from the beginning. And so you're very right. Uh, I have not learned this low carb stuff from my fellowship or from my training. Um, I think some good luck happened along the way for me was I was always interested in mind-body medicine. I was always interested in behavior. And the reason I even got into endocrinology was I realized that the hormones sort of brought everything together is the heart talks to the lung, talks to the kidney, talks to the pancreas, talks to the brain. And it just felt like knowing the hormones would help me know the whole body and it would be really fascinating to get that sort of a grip. And another reason I liked endocrinology uh, before I got into low carb was just, uh, I did have that understanding is the conditions that can be impacted through lifestyle, a large part of those were sitting in endocrinology or habit change and behavior change. I was aware of that, whether it was weight management or um, obesity or type two diabetes and even carbohydrate counting in type one diabetes. And I think that probably gave me an edge was the math that I could show people with type one diabetes that if they took more carbs, they'd have to take more of an insulin bolus. And so that understanding was there. We didn't have that level of intelligence in type two diabetes for some reason. It took us a long time to sort of bring that knowledge into other areas of healthcare uh, about reducing carbs. But it, it, that sort of seed was planted uh, all through. And The turning point for me probably started in 2011 when we had decided to move to India. I realized that I was coming back to a country that I had left uh, without having ever practiced there. So I'd finished my medical school and was gone for 10 years and pretty much grew up as a doctor in the United States. So I wanted to go with more tools to be able to adapt my endocrine knowledge to the local audience and to the local population. I wanted to be relevant culturally to the local uh, situation. So to do that, I decided to become a diabetes educator in the U.S. uh, Because I felt like 
I was doing my prescription stuff, which could have stayed the same, writing the drugs. But what was happening with my prescriptions after I wrote them in the U.S. was there would be a diabetes educator who would hold classes and group education so that these patients would understand what I was telling them to do from a lifestyle perspective. So I sat in on those classes and I was like, this is really fascinating. They were the ones really sitting with the patients and talking about lifestyle and I didn't know any of it. And I was sort of jealous. I was like, I want to know how to do this. So I took that exam before I moved back to India. And life went on. I got you know, familiar with how things were happening here. I had to learn more about the food differences, of course, the culture, the way people live in multi-generational homes. They cook at home, sometimes for three generations in one morning. Uh, everybody's eating out of one kitchen, home-cooked food. There was a lot of nuance there, not so much of grab-and-go or frozen dinners and frozen lunches and things like that. So that was a learning curve. And I think it's sort of 2014 is when uh, I had started to get a real grip on what was going on and how to make a difference. And there was one patient who I talk about is he was my biggest educator when he came to us with an HbA1c of 16%. And he was maxed out on all the tablets possible for type 2 diabetes. And an HbA1c of 16% is super, super high. A normal should be less than 57 so clearly, he was supposed to be started on insulin. That's what my training had told me. And I think that's one of the reasons endocrinologists have been late to join the lifestyle um, um, you know, wagon is because we're the ones who are trained and qualified to prescribe for diabetes. If I take diabetes as the prime example of metabolic disease. And when I went in to do the diabetes educator tra training in the US, some of my colleagues were shocked and they said, why are you doing that? You're already overqualified. You're too qualified to be training as an educator. And I, I, that didn't make sense to me because I actually wanted that skill set. And so when this man, you know, a few years later, I meet him and he doesn't want to be on insulin, I knew I couldn't force him. And one thing that really sort of came in my forefront of my thinking at that point was from the education space, diabetes education space, which says, flip it from a patient compliance model where the doctor holds the power and tells the patient what to do. Flip that to a patient empowerment model where you have knowledge as a doctor that can empower the patient to decide what they want to do for themselves. And here I was trying to bulldoze this man with my insulin prescription and he was very clear he's not going to do that. And he was honest enough to tell me so we could talk about it. So I said, okay, what if you use, and I use my diabetes educator knowledge, my type 1 diabetes knowledge to say, what if you cut down on your carbs? Maybe we could see if your sugars came down. And, you know, it, the journey just went off from there and it's been no looking back. You know, I started a diabetes education uh, class at the hospital that I used to work at at the time. It was the first of its kind run by a physician, run by an endocrinologist where I was doing culturally relevant diabetes group education for these people uh, who had type 2 diabetes so that they could know what they could do to be empowered to make changes so that I could reduce the medication. And that became the sort of, you know, arrangement between me and my patients is I want to help you make the changes in your lifestyle so that I can reduce your medication. And it's been, what, nine years and no looking back. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so... Back in my engineering days, when I was wearing my engineering hat, I actually was doing a project where for uh, Bharti and Etal and uh, yep. to produce a new set-top box. And I was actually based in, it was still, it was still Bangalore back then. It's still Bangalore now or something, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I lived there for eight, 18 months. Um, so when people talk to me about doing low-carb, or keto in India, it's like always fascinating to me, like how you actually manage to do that because like everything's rice and naan and, um, you know, I mean, that's like the fundamental staple of, of all the food predominantly that I saw. Um, so how do you, how, how do you work with someone to be able to incorporate enough protein and, and fat and stuff into their, into their yeah. diet? 
Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it took me, uh, it's been so many years that every few years I'm adding new ideas and tricks to, to figure this out. Uh, another thing I had to sort of correct in the way I was practicing this was I had to get away from these one-off reactive doctor appointments, you know, where, where the field of allopathic medicine was designed for acute illnesses, infections, surgical complications. And we try to somehow use that model for chronic conditions. It doesn't really work if I don't know when the patient's going to come back to see me or there's no clear cut ongoing support or ongoing follow up. And in India, some of the challenges we face, which could, we could flip it and we use it as a strength, is there's no insurance for outpatient medicine, mostly so far. So the majority of outpatient healthcare is out of pocket. So the patient gets to decide where they want to go, which can mean that they see you once and they never come back. It can mean that you could change their prescriptions today in, an, in, a, in a notion that you've told them lifestyle changes, you've changed their medications, and you don't even know if they're coming back. And whether they experience side effects from your prescription or not, there isn't a very robust follow-up system because there's really no in-between. It's just doctor and patient doing what they need to. And so I had to get away from that model. I didn't know any other way because we've been born and raised in hospitals. That's how doctors are created is in the hospital environment. And uh, I realized that I have to stop these single visits and create a three to six month ongoing coaching program along with the medication management so that I can hold their hand so that I can look into their carbohydrates and their proteins because I could dump that on somebody in 30 minutes. It's obviously not going to be a five minute consult. It could take 30 minutes, but everybody knows that if someone tells you everything from A to Z in 30 minutes, it doesn't mean you're cured by the 31st minute. There's just too much cognitive load that you've just left the room with. And, you know, there are statistics that say that people start forgetting 50 to 60% before they even get to the car. Right. So I realized that for me to work on this, I need to give that ongoing back end support. And that's why I left hospital medicine uh, in 2016. And I went on my own so I could give this sort of an experience. And in 2020, before the pandemic uh, was a thing, in January of 2020, I finally was clear and we took this plunge is we're only going to work program basis only. And that allows me to work with them on their uh, conflict. Like one part of them understands that their food is driving these levels. One part of them understands that they would like to be on less medication. And you probably know this too, is it's, all, it's universal. I don't know anybody who really enjoys taking medication or taking pills and feeling sick and being a patient. Nobody likes that. Um, and so I think it's a failure that we've done on the, in the healthcare profession to not let people know their options properly. So sure, do I pull their carbs away? Do I tell them now you will stop your rotis and rice and naan and bread because I say so? No, but I created learning material for them, learning videos where I showed them the science of what is carbohydrate, what happens when it digests, it turns into glucose, and then let them decide because ultimately it's their body and it's their life. And a lot of people, because of what my reputation has become now in the city, they do seek this out. So I have a bit of a biased population is that the people who want less medication are the ones that come to me. So I'm not chasing people outside and in the world saying, hey, let's reduce your carbs. It's they're coming to me because they want that guidance to, to get the lifestyle changes in place towards less medication. One of the biggest problems we have is protein because even though there is a large portion that is willing to eat animal-based protein, there's still a heavy cultural push towards vegetarianism. And that by default makes people low protein. Uh, even right now, when top influencers in India or top nutritionists talk about protein, I don't see that many of them pushing even beyond 0 0.8 grams per kg per day. That's if they are even making patients count. And I'm on so many forums and I talk to so many healthcare professionals. And when I really get detail oriented with healthcare professionals, is are you sure that your patient is really getting this much protein? They're not actually counting. Most people are actually not counting grams from morning to night to know whether they're hitting any kind of a protein target. So they think one cup of dal, one egg, a piece of animal meat, maybe twice a week, uh, 
and a few servings of dairy is going to get them there. Oh, that's like really interesting. Like I said, I, uh, knowing you know the cuisine there and how they eat, it, it, it always fascinates me that you guys, you know, you know there's a couple of different Indian um, doctors that I've spoken to, you know, over, over this last few years that do it, and it's always fascinating to hear how you how you actually manage that in that in that cultural environment. It's really interesting. Um, let's go back to what I mentioned. Uh, earlier in the beginning was like how excited I was that, that you're actually an endocrinologist that gets it. Maybe, um, maybe it helped me understand why it is that as a group, the endocrinologists tend to be, of, of all the different types of doctors that I've come across, tend to be the ones that resist this concept the most. Why, why do you think that is? I think we get brainwashed by our training and our education. And I flip through the ADA algorithms every year when they come out, the diabetes uh, management uh, algorithms. And there's like a lip service given to lifestyle. It says diet and exercise in the top right in like fine print. And then this massive colorful cascade of if A1C is not a target after metformin, if they have heart disease, prescribed from this bucket. If they don't want weight gain, prescribed from this bucket. If they want to avoid hypoglycemia, prescribed from this bucket. So all the training, all the repetition goes into the pharmacotherapy of, of diabetes. If I use diabetes as the most obvious example. Um, and so I think it's one is we're brainwashed where we lack the training. None of us know how to handle diet and exercise questions. In medical school, I learned how to maybe set a fracture and suture a wound, but I didn't know anything about exercise. We did dissection in anatomy, so we knew which muscle connected which bone, but we didn't actually know movement and posture. We didn't know what it means to be fit and to be building muscle with progressively difficult workouts and progressive overload, pushing till failure. This is not part of medical training. And so the diet and exercise part uh, becomes too difficult cognitively for a physician who doesn't have training. The, the brain, I think, just short circuits and says, I don't have the time. If I talk about, let's talk about what it's like to practice as an endocrinologist in the US, where you have an insurance company or you have your employer trying to get you to make your targets. You're trying to generate good looking reports, get good A1Cs, and there's a sort of almost like a pay for performance kind of thing going on. And you're incentivized to be quick. And lifestyle coaching is we don't have the skills and we're incentivized to be, to be quick. It's much quicker to just write the drug. It, it's a quick prescription. It's a calling in a refill. So I think we're just sort of funneling that way. Uh, when I come to India, there might not be an insurance company in between me and my patient in the outpatient setting. But unfortunately, we still have a lot of pharma influence where if you visit a busy doctor in Mumbai, towards the end of their clinic. The last few patients are sort of getting into the room and visiting the doctor and heading out with their notes. You'll see the room now filling up with pharmaceutical representatives who wanna come in with their drug reminders. So it'll be a flip chart, you know, showing you things, showing you what medicine is indicated where, and the doctor's getting their educational updates uh, from pharmaceutical representatives. I've had colleagues from the endocrine world in India tell me that it's the endocrinologist feels obligated to use the medications from various pharmaceutical companies to keep them happy. Where I might prescribe a sulfonylurea from pharma company A, and then that same patient comes back a few months later, and I'll switch the brand for the molecule so that, I mean, it's not, it really breaks my heart. I was really appalled, but this is like famous people doing this is switch the brand. The patient thinks it's a medication switch, but the physician is keeping their relationships with their pharmaceutical buddies. Oh. I've also had an endocrinologist tell me that they feel obligated that if a new drug hits the market, the endocrinologists should be leading the way using those in their practice because we become the, in, in India it's called KOL, key opinion leader, is we're the ones who are invited to give those lectures advertising or promoting why the drug is safe and why they use it in certain populations. 
And if you don't use it, you don't have your own practice experience. So when the drug comes, you're supposed to start prescribing it so you can talk about it and, and give a lecture to an audience full of doctors. So these things have happened. Uh, they do happen. And um, I just couldn't swallow it. You know, I uh, even hospital-based medicine, again, endocrinology, thankfully, in the U.S., at least, I saw there was a lot of flexibility to convert yourself to an outpatient-only endocrinologist. But there are many who are hospital-based endocrinologists. And if you're hospital-based, when you're rounding on the inpatient side, you're not talking lifestyle change. If someone's got a fracture, they're on an IV insulin drip, they're in pain, they're going in and out of the operating theater, you're not going to discuss lifestyle at the bedside. And so you're again becoming a pharmaceutical insulin managing doctor if you're an endocrinologist in hospital. So again, I found that so not rewarding. I wanted to be the one talking to the patient about lifestyle change. And, and I think the ones who stay in hospital medicine, they have to really decide wh what role do they want to play in, in the patient's life? And is it just about prescribing the medications, the top medications, because we're the maximally trained in them? Or is it to do this other bit? So I think... Uh, it's, a de it's an identity crisis, if I have to summarize, uh, is do you feel empowered to do the lifestyle changes with your patients? And, and who are you? Are you a prescriber of medications or are you there to help your patients heal? It's so amazing, you know, um, the fact that you, that you see it and then you, you're prepared to actually put your weight behind it and, and, and try to help move the needle. It's, uh, it's commendable. Um, I'm, I met with some some high-powered businessmen like in the last few days before starting off before the conference started and then yesterday via Zoom. Um, we haven't signed any contracts or whatever yet, but they're trying to get me involved in an organization that they're building that I can't talk too much about right now. But mm -hmm. the idea is to create this big ecosystem to create like an environment for metabolic medicine to exist. And they're thinking worldwide. And one of the things they're getting me involved with is, for, you know, because they want the doctors and whatever that are going to be in this network to be accredited. So working with the accreditation process that we've got on the SMHP side. Um, and then also um, to try to increase the reach that these events that we put on um, have. So put some, a bunch of marketing and money behind promoting the event so more and more people hear about it because, you know, our, all the ones around the country, we're all struggling to put bums in seats because we don't have the marketing expertise or the money to throw at marketing in order to, to get it out there that we even exist and that this, that this event. And there's a lot of people that would come, uh, you know, and we have people that come all the time. That, especially the ones that sign up last minute and they're saying like, why didn't you promote this? I didn't even know this existed, you know? And it's like, funny we could, we just don't have the money and we don't have the expertise. We're not marketing people. So right. it's so exciting to have these skills and the finance behind it that we've never had before. Um, and they, the aim is to initially target, some, you know, some of the events around the country here in the, in the US and, and build those up but very soon start to look at now replicating that um, internationally. And India is, is one of the, the countries that, that's kind of come up first in the discussions about where we want to go to. So hopefully uh, in fairly short order, you know, I'll be able to come to you and start working with you and, and some of the other um, Indian doctors that I've kind of met over the years uh, and let's put a big event on in, in Mumbai or, or Bangalore or one of those places in India. I think it would be epic. Oh, it would be a huge hit, you know. Um, so there's there's always this churn phase, you know. I mean, I've stood on the stage and spoke about reducing insulin in someone who's been on insulin for 10 plus years. And my team, my staff were sitting in the second row and people sitting ahead of them in the front row, doctors were whispering to each other saying, she's being reckless, you know? So there's, there's, we're all conditioned. I've myself, you know, so not to uh, uh, criticize, you know, our own colleagues, but I've been brainwashed the same way. I've sat across from patients probably until 2014, uh, till, I, till my eyes opened better, 
I've convinced patients that they need insulin therapy for progressive type 2 diabetes because I just didn't know better. And I think sequentially, you know, things started to pop into my into my universe where I could start to connect the dots. And yeah, what happened with that patient and then finding this therapeutic fasting kind of a concept, which Dr. Jason Fung has sort of made popular, those things were really transformational for me. Um, and and there's, there is growth now. There is hunger now in India for this. There are startups now uh, where endocrinologists are involved. So it's not all bad. There are endocrinologists who are putting their faces to the idea of diabetes reversal, diabetes remission, lifestyle change. I think uh, it's a good thing because there's investor money coming, there's startup money and all that happening um, from people who want to see what they can scale with technology. I think there's going to still be a gap, and this is something you and I are going to probably be talking about next week, is the soft skills about how to actually sit at that bedside or at that table side or virtual, you know, talking to your patients about behavior change, where it's easy for me to say low carb will get you off your meds, but the people who need the help in those in-between doctor visits, the actual hand-holding and coaching, because behavior change is extremely complex. And that's the piece that, you know, and so I took the SMHP training to be part of this community with you all. And I'm also working aggressively on coaching techniques is to, because we all need these soft skills to be able to make a difference. It's not going to be just about knowing what to do. We're going to have to help people in their culturally relevant context to actually do it and yeah. change the way society is looking at these things. That's amazing. Yeah. So I look forward to working with you and helping to get it into the Indian culture. But what you say is so true across the world, right? That we And we have to understand those cultures and find people that are working within that environment, like you are in India, um, who understand that to help us then be able to understand how we need to approach those people in order to, to help them feel that this is something that, that, that they can do um, within their cultural boundaries and and be successful with. Um, so if if people are, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that listen to this who, who are maybe in India who want to uh, who want to maybe follow up with you. If somebody wants to, to contact you or, or um, you know maybe consult with you or something like that in India, how do they get hold of you? Or how do they, how would they approach you? Oh sure. Yeah, that would that would be nice if we could help people or connect and stay in touch with people. Uh, I'm I'm on um, Instagram and LinkedIn. It's my first name, last name uh, is the handle for Instagram. That's me, and we have a website. Yeah, yep, just the first name and the last name, uh, yeah. Roshni Kangani. And the, I'm also on LinkedIn. And my website for my practice is called Rayson Health. Um, it's R E I S double A N. Raysan Health, Raysan. it's one okay. word. I'll put yeah. it in the, in the show Health. notes as well. So, but yeah. I'll put it in the show notes, yeah. Raysan, RaysanHealth.com. Yes. Okay. All right, cool. We'll, uh, we'll get that in the notes. And, um, you know, hopefully there's a bunch more people that reach out to you that you'll be able to help. And that's, uh, that's kind of our main aim, all of us, right? That's what we're trying to do is yeah. help more people. So, help more um, people. Yeah, thank you so much for what you're doing and uh and for taking the time to do this and you know hopefully we'll be speaking soon about maybe coming and putting on an event in in uh, mumbai i would love to help let me know how i can help and i look forward to doing more exciting things right and for those for those who are members of the smhp uh we, we've talking you mentioned it a little bit back but we're talking about getting you to do a lecture on in our grand rounds program there as well so for those of you who are members there, uh, look out for that and uh, come and attend that. Okay. Thank you so much, Doug. It was great talking to you. All right. Awesome. You've been listening to an episode of the Low Carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lowcarbusa.